right? Let's work through a few example problems for chapter six. Chapter six is having us understand how companies can track the cost of inventory once it's purchased. Um, in a prior chapter, we looked at the purchases and sales of inventory and how we account for them. Now we're going to look at the accounting for the cost once the inventory has been purchased. First problem we're going to work with here, Denson's department store uses a perpetual inventory system. Data for one product, E2D2, includes the following purchases. They purchased 50 units of the product at a $10 cost on May 7th purchased another 30 units of inventory and they paid $13. On June 1st, which is right in between the dates of the purchases, Jensen sold 30 units and on August 27th, after these purchases, 40 more units were sold. We are going to prepare some schedules to apply the different methods that allow us to track the cost within the accounting system. The first method we're going to look at is the FIFO method. This method's abbreviation stands for first in, first out. It assumes the first inventory in or the first purchase is the first to go out or the first to be sold. So looking at what we have here, let's prepare this little schedule. You're going to want to do this as you are working through homework problems. Um, set up a little schedule um, that has you kind of set it up like this. It's the easiest way to keep track of these costs. Um, May 7th. You're starting with 50 units of inventory that had cost $10 a piece. So the beginning inventory has a total value of $500. The balance of inventory means they have total inventory at a cost of $500 available to be sold at, as of May 7th. The next thing that happened chronologically, on June 1st, they sold 30 units. Applying the FIFO method, we are going to assume that the first inventory in is the first to be sold. On the date of the sale, on June 1st, the only inventory that this company has on hand are 50 units at a cost of $10 a piece. That means that when they sold 30 units on June 1st, all 30 units had to have been from this layer of $10 units. So to assign a cost of the goods sold on the date of the sale, we will assign a cost of $10 per unit. 30 units were sold, we are assigning a cost of $10, the cost of goods sold that we will record on the date of that sale will be $300. When we go to prepare the two journal entries required when inventory is sold. The first journal entry records the revenue being earned. The amount recorded in that entry will be the selling price of the inventory. The second journal entry records the cost of the inventory that was sold or used up. That's where this number comes in. This has been the assigned cost to the inventory sold for that sale. That will leave us with, out of 50 units that were there before the sale, only 20 units will remain. The cost is $10 per unit, leaving a balance in inventory after the sale on June 1st of $200. The next thing that happened chronologically was on July 28th, Another 30 units were purchased at a cost of 13. When those 30 units were purchased. The inventory went from having just 20 units at a cost of $10 each to another 30 units that had cost $13 each, bringing the cost of the inventory available for sale up to $590. Finally, the last chronological thing to happen was on August 27th. 40 units were sold. On August 27th, when we're trying to assign a cost of goods sold, we need to come up with the cost for 40 units sold. Under the FIFO method, we assume out of the inventory available for sale on the date of the sale that the first in is the first to be sold. First in were 20 units at a cost of $10 each, so of the 40 units sold, 20 of them will be assigned a cost of $10, and that wipes out that layer of inventory. We still need a cost for 20 more inventory items, so we go to the next first in layer. This is the next layer that came in. Of the 30 that were on hand, 
20 of them were sold to account for the full 40 units sold on August 27th. We are going to assign a cost of $13 to those last 20 units. If we were to multiply this out and add it up, the total cost assigned to those units sold is $460. Out of the inventory on hand when that was that sale was made, 40 of them were sold. All 20 of those were considered sold. Out of this 30, 20 were sold, leaving the ending balance in inventory of $130. 10 units at a cost of 13. Using that same data, let's apply the second method companies can use to track cost within the accounting system. That is the LIFO method. The LIFO method assumes that the last inventory in or the last inventory purchased is the first to go out or the first to be sold. Again, we're starting with the same beginning inventory. They purchased 50 units at $10 each. Total cost of inventory available for sale is $500. On June 1st, when they made a sale, they sold 30 units. To assign a cost to those 30 units under the LIFO method, we are going to start with the last layer in. At the time of the sale, we only had one layer of inventory, so it makes it pretty straightforward. Of the 30 units sold, all of them came from this layer of $10 each. So we will assign a cost of goods sold of $300. That leaves 20 units at a cost of $10 each or a cost of goods that are available to be sold of $200. On July 28th, 30 more units were purchased. We are adding to the inventory. We still have these 20 at 10 because nothing has happened. We haven't sold them. We are now adding 30 units at 13. I mean the total cost of goods available for sale up to $590. Finally, on August 27th, we sold 40 units. Applying the LIFO method, the last in is the first expected to, or assumed, not expected, assumed to go out. This is the inventory on hand when the sale was made. The last layer in were those 30 at 13. Because we sold 40, all 30 of those are assumed to be sold. Then we need to get a cost for 10 more. We are going to go to the next last in layer. These are the next last in inventory items. 10 of those are assumed sold at $10. We have now accounted for all 40 units sold. If we were to multiply those out and add them up, the total cost we would assign to the goods sold, the cost of goods sold for that sale would be $490. Our inventory ending balance after that sale would be, out of all of these, only $10 at $10 a piece still remain because we sold all 30 of those and of the 20, we sold 10, leaving 10 at $10 or $100 total cost of goods available for sale. That is an example of applying the FIFO and LIFO method. Now let's do the moving average cost. Using the same set of data, we're starting off with the same initial purchase, starting off with 50 units at $10 a piece or $500. On June 1st, we sold 30 units using the average cost to assign to the cost of goods sold, we need to figure out on the date of the sale, what is the average cost of the inventory sold? So the way we do that is to come up with an average cost. When you need to get the average of something, you are going to take the total dollar amount, total inventory amount is 500, and divide by the number of units. 500 is the total cost, 50 units. Currently, the average cost of each unit in inventory is $10. That is what we will assign to the cost of goods sold, a $10 per cost per unit sold, or $300.
we had 500 available before the sale, $300 is sold, leaving us with 20 units at an average cost of $10 a piece or $200. On July 28th, we made another purchase. This purchase was made at a cost other than what the current average is. That means that our average cost per unit will change. Every time a purchase is made, we are going to need to calculate a new average. So after that purchase is made, we had 20 units, purchase 30, brings our total units up to 50. We had $200, we bought 390, bringing the new total dollar amount up to 590 of inventory available for sale. If I take my new dollar amount, I have total inventory of $590, and divide by the total number of units, I have 50. My new average cost is $11.80 per unit. On August 27th, when I made that sale of 40 units, under the average cost, the moving average cost, we would have sign a cost of 11 and 80 cents, which is the current average, times the number of units sold, or a total cost of $472. That will leave us with 10 units in inventory, because we had 50, we sold 40, leaving us with 10 units at a cost of 11.80, or $118 in ending inventory. All right, let's try that again. Let's use a different set of examples out of here. Yount Company reports the following for the month of June. They're starting June with beginning inventory of 200 units at a cost of five. Total cost of inventory at the beginning of June, 1,000. They made two purchases during the month of June, leaving them with inventory of 120 units at the end of the month. They want us to calculate the cost of the ending inventory and cost of goods sold for each cost flow assumption using the perpetual inventory system. We are going to assume that there was a sale of 400 units on June 15th, sold for $8 a piece, and a sale of 480 units on June 27th for $9 a piece. Let's start with the FIFO method. And that kind of got cut off. Let's get it all down here. All right, under the FIFO method, we are starting with beginning inventory of 200 units at $5 a piece, beginning inventory of 1,000. The first thing that happens chronologically is on June 12th, we purchased 300 at a cost of $6 per unit, total of 1,800. When we made that purchase on June 12th, we are increasing our inventory we still have the 200 at 5 that we started the month with, and then we added 300 at 6. I mean, the total cost of the inventory available for sale as of June 12th up to 2800 The next thing that happened chronologically is that on June 15th, we sold 400 units. The selling price was $8 per unit. That will be the amount we would record in our entry to record the revenues earned. Now we need to figure out what we are going to record for the cost of that sale. Using the FIFO method, 400 units were sold on June 15th. This is the inventory on hand when that sale was made. We are going to assume the first in is the first out. Of the 400 sold, 200 had to have come from this layer of $5 a piece. Part of the cost of goods sold will be 1,000. We need to get a cost for another 200 to account for all 400 sold. That means we are gonna go to the next first in layer. That layer is wiped out, let's go to the next first in layer. That means out of these 300, at $6 costs, we are gonna assume 200 of them are sold. Total cost of goods sold for that sale will be $3,200. Out of the inventory we had on hand before that sale, the only inventory remaining is 100 at six. We 
because all 200 at 5 are assumed sold, and of the 300 at 6, 200 were sold. Leaves us with inventory on June 15th of $600 total. Chronologically, on June 23rd was the next thing to occur. We made another purchase, 500 units at a cost of $7 a piece. That increases our inventory. We still have the 100 at 6. We just added 500 at 7, bringing the cost of the inventory available for sale up to 4100 The next thing that occurred on June 27th is we sold 480 units. The selling price was $9 per unit for our revenue transaction. Now let's get a cost. Using the FIFO method, we have 480 units we need to account for. We have 600 units on hand. Of those 600 units, the first in had a cost of $6. All 100 of those are assumed to be sold. Part of our cost of goods sold is 600. We need to get the cost for another 380 to account for the total 480 sold. Of the 500 in the next first in layer, 380 are assumed to be sold. Total cost of goods sold for that sale will be $3,260. Inventory remaining will only be $120 at a cost of $7 each because all 100 at 6 are assumed sold and of the 500, 380 are assumed sold, leaving 120 at $7 a piece. Ending cost of goods sold $840 at the end of June. Total cost of goods sold for the month of the June, adding up the two cost of goods sold, $54.60. Applying the LIFO method. On June 1st, 200 units at $5 a piece, starting the month with $1,000. The first thing that occurred was another purchase. Increases the inventory up to $2,800. On June 15th, we sold 400 units. Of the inventory on hand, applying the LIFO method, we will start with the last in layer. Last in layer were the 300 at $6 a piece. All of them are sold because we sold 400. We need to go to the next last in layer. Here is the next last in layer. Of those, 200, 100 are assumed to be sold. Total cost of goods sold for that sale will be 2300. It will leave us with 100 at $5 a piece because all of these are assumed sold and 100 of these are assumed sold, leaving 100 at 5. On June 23rd, we made another purchase, increasing our inventory. We still have the 100 at 5. We added another layer of 500 at 7, meaning our inventory available for sale up to 4,000. On June 27th, when we made a sale of 480 units, under the last in first out, the LIFO method, we start with the last layer in. Of the inventory available for sale, the last in were 507. All 480 come out of that layer. 480, $7 cost a piece. We are assigning a cost of 3360 to that sale. That will leave us with 100 at 5. And out of these 500, only 20 remain. Ending inventory under the LIFO method, 640. Total cost of goods sold, 5660 Finally, under the moving average cost, starting with the same number of units available for sale, beginning inventory at the beginning of the month, we made a purchase. When we made that purchase, it's going to change the cost of our average because that purchase was made at $6 a piece. Remember, to get the new average, we need to take the total cost of goods available for sale. We had 1,000, we bought 1,800, 
means we now have $2,800 of inventory available for sale. We divide by the number of units available for sale. We had 200 units, we purchased 300, we have 500 units available for sale. 2,800 divided by 500. The average cost after that purchase of each unit on hand is $5.60. That means on June 15th, when we sold 400 units, under the moving average cost method, we will assign a cost of 560 to the units sold because that is the current average cost. That will leave us with only 400 units remaining since 400 were sold. Total dollar amount remaining will be 2800 less the cost of goods sold or 560. On June 23rd, we made another purchase. Guess what happens to the average cost when we made that purchase? It changes. We need to get the new average cost. We had 560 on hand. We purchased another 3,500. That caused our total cost of inventory available for sale to 4,060. So we now have total dollar amount of 4,060. Our new unit amount, we had 100. We just purchased 500, so we now have 600 units. So we divide the total amount by the number of units to get a new average cost. I would probably round that to $6.77. What that means is on June 27th, when we sold 480 units, we will be assigning a cost of $6.77 to those units sold. Total cost of goods sold, $32.48. That will leave us with 120 units on hand. The average cost is $6.77. And Dean balance an inventory of $8.12. Total cost of goods sold under the weighted average or the moving average cost method. 5,488. One question the problem asked us is why is the average unit cost not simply by taking the total amount of the purchases and dividing by three to get the average of those three purchases? And the simple answer is, is that gives us an average over the entire month. What we're doing is we're doing a moving average. We're looking at the average after every purchase because we want to record the cost of the goods sold on the date of the sale. So we need an average cost when the sale is made. So that's why you can't use um, the simple average formula. One other thing I wanted to point out really quick is another way to calculate um, cost of goods sold and that is to take um, essentially what the problem did here is to add up the total cost of the inventory that was available for sale throughout the month. Inventory available for sale is comprised of the beginning inventory plus the purchases made during the month. So the total cost of goods available for sale was 6300 Then for each of these methods, if you take the total cost of goods sold or excuse me, if you can take the total cost of goods available for sale and then subtract out the ending amount of inventory under these methods, you can come up with the cost of goods sold because the difference between the inventory available for sale and the cost assigned to the ending inventory, well, the difference is going to be how the cost of the inventory had been sold. Um, and so they took that little shortcut here for all of these methods. Total cost of goods available for sale minus the ending inventory balance to get the cost of goods sold. Total cost of goods available for sale minus the ending inventory to get the cost of goods sold for the month. All right, one other problem we're going to work with, um, and that is using the gross profit method um, to assign a cost to the inventory. Um, so this particular example, Brenda reported the following information for the last two months of 2014. 
the end of December, Brenda's inventory was destroyed in a fire. So they don't know what to assign to the inventory at the end of the month. They're going to use the gross profit method to assign um, the, or estimate the cost of the inventory lost in the fire. Um, the reason they would need to do this is for insurance purposes. You know, if insurance is going to cover the cost of their losses, they need to know the cost of the inventory they lost in the fire. All right, in order to do this, we are first going to compute the gross profit rate for November. So in November, remember, the gross profit rate is takes the um, cost of the goods sold and divides by the, the net sales or the total sales. So in November, we have sales revenue of 26.1. We have our cost of goods sold of 570,009. We figure that out by taking the beginning inventory and the ending inventory amount. Um, and if we know how much was purchased, we can figure out the cost of goods sold. Um, because remember, any account is really a four piece puzzle. You have a beginning inventory. The beginning inventory was 129.6. We purchased 505,400 during the month means they had $635,000 of inventory available for sale. If they ended November with 64,991, the difference between the cost of the goods available for sale and the inventory at the end of the month, the difference would be how much had been sold. So if they had a cost of goods sold of $570 and $9, the sales minus the cost of goods sold leaves them with a gross profit of 256091 That means that their gross profit rate is the gross profit divided by sales of 31%. So now we can use November's gross profit rate to determine the estimated cost of the inventory lost in the fire. We do know that in December, sales were 987.7. Sales of 987.7. Based on November's gross profit rate of 31%, 31% of the 987.7 in sales is assumed to be profit, or 306,187 is estimated to be the, the gross profit off of the amount sold. That means if we sold for 987.7, the gross profit was 306. We are estimating the cost of goods sold to be 681,513. Now that we know the estimated cost of goods sold, if we add the beginning inventory to the cost of goods purchased, we have cost of goods available for sale of 840,191 subtract out the estimate of what was sold, which we brought down from up here, to get the estimated cost of the inventory of 158678 So let me just recap that. We know the amount of sales for December. Of the sales, 31% of it will be remaining as gross profit. That means that total sales 306,187 remains for gross profit. Cost of goods sold must have been 681,513. We started the month with 64,991 in inventory. We purchased another 775,200 in inventory. And all of that was given up here in the, in the problem. That means that beginning plus purchases, we had 840,191 goods available for sale, we are estimating that 681,513 is sold, we then estimate ending inventory to be 158,678. All right, let me know if you all have questions. Hope your day's going well.